Good morning, Emmanuel Bible Church family. A heartfelt Good Friday welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the crucifixion of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Before we begin, I'd like to read you a portion of Scripture. It says in Isaiah 53, 5, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Join us as we begin in worship. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came for to be born of a virgin among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shine among us his glory revealed living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he just
The significance of a day like today takes precedence over any circumstance that we're undergoing in our lives now, no matter how universally devastating it is. And the reason is the event we're commemorating provides the ultimate remedy for the very malady that the whole world is being held captive to. Paul the Apostle says, as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord in Romans 5. Today, we hope to see how this is true through a poignant story tied to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We're nearing the end of the most significant week of the year as calendars for human history go. Jesus, the Son of God, has purposefully set his focus on the very event for which he came into this world. And what happened during this week commands our full attention. On this Good Friday, we want to consider a serious thing that happened on the way to the Passover celebration. It happened to a man by the name of Simon, who had traveled all the way from his homeland, Cyrene, what is today modern-day Libya, to celebrate the Passover. The Passover was the memorial of God's deliverance of his people Israel from captivity in Egypt. And Jews of the diaspora, that is the scattering, would travel from surrounding regions and countries to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate this memorial. When Simon arrived at Jerusalem, something unusual was happening, at least as far as this particular festival was concerned. I want us to read it. It has to do with Jesus. He's already been placed on trial he, the verdict has been given, and he's on his way to Golgotha with the cross on his shoulders. And in Luke chapter 23, if you would take your copy of the scriptures and follow along as I read, Luke 23, beginning at verse 26, the text reads like this, When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country, and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. I'm going to jump down to verse 32 and continue reading. Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was an inscription above him which said, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he, he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. That is the account that Simon witnessed. And we'll read more in just a moment. But I want to share with you four stages of this event that Simon was a party to. The first stage is this, that Simon the Cyrenian was given a serious ultimatum. Notice in verse 26, Now as they led Jesus away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Simon was being pressed into service by the Roman government. We know from even what Jesus said during his earthly ministry in Matthew's gospel, it says, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. And so the Jewish people living under Roman law were to abide by Roman law, one of which was the law of impressment. 
And the Roman government could press anyone into its service to carry a load as far as one mile. And it was Jesus who had already said, if one compels you to go one mile, go with him too. And so Simon was being asked to do this. He was being told to do it, to help Jesus, to carry the cross of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Simon most likely didn't know who Jesus was at the time, but he probably found out later and believed. And we know this because of references to Simon's family. His son's names, Alexander and Rufus, are mentioned in Mark's gospel, which implies that they became known as believers within the Roman church, which was primarily Mark's audience, the gospel of Mark. We also know that Paul the Apostle mentions Rufus in his closing salutation to the church at Rome. And so these are indicators of the fact that Simon's family came to know and believe in Jesus Christ. The point here is that on the basis of Roman law, Simon was conscripted to help carry the cross of Christ because Jesus was too weak and the soldiers didn't want him to collapse and die before he got to the place of execution. Quite a stark uh, circumstance that Simon was placed into having come to celebrate the Passover. Here's the second part of Simon's uh, involvement in this story and this account. He was in the presence of a serious accusation that took place. In verses 35 to 37 of Luke 23 it says, the people stood looking on But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he's the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, then save yourself. And so Simon was witnessing this, and there were accusations being uh, thrown at Jesus, that he wasn't who he said he was, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, the son of God, and that he couldn't do what he said he could do, that is, save himself and save others. So Simon, who was there, and he witnessed the people, the soldiers, even the thieves on the cross, questioning Jesus' claims as to who he was and what he had come to do. The third phase of this account is that Simon the Cyrenian might have overheard a serious conversation. And it had to do with the thieves who were being crucified on crosses next to Jesus. This is found in verses 39 to 43. The text reads, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So Simon is no doubt witnessing this since he was the one who bore Jesus' cross to get him to the place of the crucifixion. And so he might have overheard the conversation between Jesus and the two criminals, Uh, the one criminal having mocked Jesus and the other having believed on him. He might have overheard the conversation about eternal destiny and salvation. The thief offered a prayer of faith that's noted in verse 42. He said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It was an honest prayer of faith. He calls him Lord. The thief, along with the crowd, had originally mocked Jesus, but now he'd had a change of heart and come to recognize who he was. It was a humble expression, a humble prayer. When uh, expressing fear of God, he recognized the power and authority of Christ and his own helplessness, and he recognized the justness of his own punishment and the injustice even of Christ's punishment. It was an urgent uh, uh, request, an urgent prayer, motivated by fear of condemnation and judgment. The thief was condemned and about to die, and time was fleeting, the opportunity was slipping. He understood that his life would soon pass from him. And so this plea to Jesus was an urgent one, and it was very simple when he said, remember me. 
It demonstrated the simplest of faith in the strongest object, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so the Savior, in response to what the thief had called out for Jesus to do, extended a promise of favor to him. And it was a certain kind of a promise when he precedes it by saying truly or assuredly. And in that, Jesus, in line with his character, uh, cannot deny himself. His character is holy. His word is reliable. So that when he says truly, it indeed is true. It was an immediate response when he says, today you will be with me in paradise. There was no waiting period. There were no extraneous requirements. It was a compassionate response provided to the sinner in spite of his sins and in spite of any good deeds that he may have been noted uh, for before he became a criminal. It was provided by Jesus, the one who was dying on the cross in his place. It was personal. When Jesus says to him, you will be with me in paradise. And the same is true for any who place their faith in Jesus. It is a personal response uh, and privilege that is granted to those who place their faith in him. Those who die in Christ go to be with him at death or at his return in the air. And in the case of the thief on the cross, he went to be with Jesus Immediately, today you will be with me in paradise. And that place, paradise, is known in the ancient Near Eastern culture as being a garden, a place of splendor. And that word was chosen intentionally to depict the place where God is. We can recall what Jesus said to his followers before he went to the cross, meeting with them in the upper room. He says, don't let your heart be troubled You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's where Jesus took the penitent thief uh, to be with him in paradise that day. And the point of this is Simon, having witnessed it, He may have overheard Jesus when he promised the thief who trusted in him that he would uh, join Jesus in paradise on that very day. Here's a fourth phase of this account uh, that's spoken to us beginning at verse 44 where Simon the Cyrenian witnessed a serious violation. Beginning in verse 44, it says, Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, Jesus breathed his last. And so when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts. And returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. The serious violation that Simon had witnessed in this moment was that he saw that they were executing an innocent man. And the centurion who made the remark that he made is indicating this. He said, Certainly there was a this was a righteous man. He was innocent. Isaiah the prophet foretold this about the crucifixion of Christ in Isaiah 53 and verse 9. He had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And so the violation that uh, was taking place here was that an innocent man was being crucified. And Simon was witness to it. But Simon also saw that they were crucifying the Son of God. Matthew in Mark's gospel quoted the centurion as saying in their account, surely this is the Son of God. And the point we take from this is that Simon would likely come to understand that Jesus' death is not so much about what mankind did to him, even though it was a serious violation. It was about what Christ did for us, 
voluntarily. Because it never would have happened had Jesus not intended to do it. We know from other portions of Scripture, Old Testament and New, about the significance of this uh, offering that Jesus was making of himself on behalf of the sins of the world. Again, Isaiah the prophet in 53 says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement which brings about our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. He's turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Peter the Apostle says in his epistle, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the Spirit. And Paul the Apostle says in Romans chapter 5, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Then John the Apostle put it like this, In this was manifested the love of God toward us in that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Here's the key thought in all of this account of remembering Christ's death for us on this significant day. The death of Jesus Christ is so serious a matter that its impact reaches to our particular needs today. Yes, today. Somebody might ask the question, what does the Good Friday event, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, have to do with our circumstances today? Given all the misery that is taking place in the world with the virus, the pandemic that is plaguing uh, mankind, the answer to the question is this. The death of Jesus Christ is the ultimate remedy for all the death and dying in the world today. Death, both physical and spiritual, is the consequence of the entrance of the virus of sin into the world through the disobedience of mankind which originated in Adam and is amplified all the more by the personal sin of each individual. Paul put it like this, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So that death passed upon all men, because all have sinned. For the wages of sin is death. Now I want you to note this. Please note this with me. Christ's death for us was an atoning sacrifice that required him to become afflicted with the virus of sin in order to provide the antidote, the remedy for you and for me. How does that work? Paul said it like this in his second epistle to the Corinthians when he says, For he, God, has made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Several years ago, there was an epidemic that was taking place coming out of Africa Uh, the continent of Africa, the country of Liberia. And you can recall in 2014, the Ebola plague. I want to share with you an account of a doctor who was there with Samaritan's Purse ministering to the victims of this plague. And he himself contracted the virus. Listen as I read this account. The Ebola survivor, Dr. Kent Brantley, in 2014 donated the plasma in his blood to three patients, echoing what one of his former patients did for him before he left the country of Liberia. Brantley was caring for sick Ebola patients with the aid group Samaritan's Purse in Monrovia, Liberia, when he became the first American diagnosed with Ebola in late July. His condition was worsening before he was flown to the United States in an air ambulance But before he left, one of his former patients, a 14-year-old Ebola survivor, gave him a unit of blood for a transfusion. 
After his recovery in August of that same year, Brantley donated his plasma to Samaritan's Purse colleague, Dr. Rick Sacra, and to freelance cameraman Ashoka Mukpo, both of whom were receiving treatment for Ebola. Another American Ebola patient, Dallas nurse Nina Pham, also received a blood donation of some kind from Brantley. Here's how doctors think this works. When confronted with a virus, the immune system creates antibodies to specifically target that virus, to kill it and keep it from coming back. And once a person has antibodies, they stay in their blood for life. And if the Ebola antibodies found in an Ebola survivor's blood can be imported into a struggling Ebola patient's body, those antibodies can theoretically help the patient's immune system fight off the deadly virus. Doctors say that even though the sick person's body is trying to make antibodies, an infection can be so overwhelming that the sick person's immune system might not be able to keep up with the invading virus. And as a result, the sooner someone gets a plasma transfusion, the more likely it is to help that person recovery. And that was the case back in 2014 with these survivors. Let me just draw an observation from this account. In a more potent and effective way, those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ have been cured by having the benefits of his death, his shed blood applied to them. And his blood is 100% effective in providing new life to those who are dying without hope. That's the significance of the death of Jesus Christ for you and for me in light of our greatest problem, which is the virus of sin. For God hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And seeing that Jesus was dying for our sins, I have a question for you. Have you received the benefits of what he has done for you, which are forgiveness and eternal life? You do that by faith. But as many as received him, to them gave he the privilege, the opportunity to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. It's simple, childlike faith. If you've never done that, you can personally, consciously call on his name, recognizing him as the Son of God who died in your place, just like that thief on the cross 2,000 years ago. He didn't have a whole lot of knowledge. He didn't have a whole lot of background on who Jesus was, but he came to understand that he was the Lord of the universe and that he had the power to forgive. And he called on him by the simple request, remember me. And you can do the same thing today, calling on the name of Jesus Christ and asking him to remember you. And in putting your faith in him, the benefits of what he has done in his death and resurrection will be applied to you. And the sin that you and I are guilty of will be removed. If that's your story, and for all of you who are listening today, if you have received Jesus Christ, here's a question. Have you given yourself back to him in gratitude for what he's done for you by living your life for his glory. For you've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We owe our lives to him. And regardless of the circumstance we live under today, we are so blessed by the favor he's bestowed on us through the work he's accomplished on the cross on our behalf. We have so much to be grateful for. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten, then nailed to a cross of wood. This, the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. I 
significance of this day is not lost on us. It is the power of the cross that has sustained believers throughout the history of the church, going all the way back to the first century. I trust the cross of Christ is your sustenance as well. From the writer of Hebrews, we find solace. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded By so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such contradiction, from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and faint in your mind. 